Welcome back to PAX East 2018, day four. Day right four. At the Shack News booth. Going strong. We have some special guests from Phantom Doctrine. We have Casper. And we have Blaze. Hello. Here to talk, here to talk about Phantom Doctrine and all sorts of good stuff that you guys have been working on. How long have you been working on this game? Uh, about two years. Three, Three years. years. Two years. Two years. And a bit. Okay. Yeah. And what engine is it running on? Uh, on Unreal 4. Ah, yeah, yeah. that's always a good one. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, we switched from Unity because our previous game, uh, Hard West, that was a Unity uh, title. And, you know, as the company grew, as the project got bigger, we also made the jump to Unreal. And how big is your team? Uh, 46. Oh, uh, okay, so that's, that's a large team. Yeah, we doubled in size since Hard West. Congratulations. That's probably on the back of the success of that game, huh? Yeah, definitely. But it's process, also though. what the game needs, right? Because yep. it's a huge game, uh, massive amount of content, long hours, and that's yep. that's it. Yep. We just couldn't make it uh, any more efficiently. Yeah, that is so true. for people who haven't heard of your game yet, I don't know what's wrong with them, but <laughs> describe what genre it falls into. Or how you would describe it. Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Right? Well, uh, it's hard. When you look at it, it's what like... What do we call it? Well, it's a tactical Cold War thriller. Uh, that's the best we could come up can, with. That's not very descriptive and long. Can I tell you what I tell people? Because I'm very excited for this game. Oh. And what I've told them is it's XCOM with spies. Okay, that works. Yeah, that yeah. Kind of it, works. it's definitely more ambitious than that term, that phrase yeah. Yeah. will let it lead it on to be. But that gives people an idea of what to expect with the combat and stuff okay. like that. But there's a lot going on with the spy mechanic. Wanna yeah, well, uh, XCOM is definitely the benchmark in the genre. Hi, Firaxis, we love you. <laughs> uh, so that's that's a fair, fair way to make it easier for people to understand what they're exactly dealing with. But then the formula is so, you know, uh, so wide and, and you can do so much creatively with it yeah. that just doing alien invasions is definitely not the only thing that can be developed around it, right? True, though. We've Very seen true. Mario Rabbids, and that's oh, great, yeah, that's too, true. right? That's true. Yeah, yeah. that's a good case. Yeah. Gotcha. So what are people going to be getting into when they jump into Phantom Doctrine? It's a very broad statement. There's a lot oh, to go. Uh, <laughs> yep. Can you, like, slice this question up a bit? Slice it up a bit for you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, All yeah. Right. Uh, well, I know that combat is an aspect of the game, yes, but there's is. a lot that goes on before you even shoot the first weapon, right? Like, to start with... You can even you can go through almost the whole game without shooting anyone. Oh, really? Or yep. attacking anyone, uh, yep. except cool. for like main objective targets and stuff like that. Uh, there are a lot of missions that can totally skip and like s stick to arranging or managing your network of spies around the world. So uh, it very much depends on what you feel like doing at the moment in the game. Gotcha, gotcha. So there's some people they can do a run and gun type of thing if they want, or they can more. So I, I've seen that you can infiltrate the other side, have like some sleeper agents and things like that. Yeah, well, just getting to the maybe calling it combat is just a oversimplification. The tactical phase, so the 3D missions that you go on, yeah, they themselves support, like Casper said, fully support stealth and combat. It's up to you, and uh, that's a design philosophy across all of Phantom Doctrine that, uh, you know, when devs say you can do what you want, it sometimes means that, uh, you know, they don't really have a good idea. But in our case, it's really trying to support all uh, play styles. So uh, unlike many other uh, turn-based tactical games, which just fall onto the stealth or combat spectrum, we try to support both. And I think we achieved a very good balance. You can, like Casper said, you can infiltrate, go behind the scenes, uh, take out guards, just hide bodies, and uh, never be seen. Or you can just equip heavy armor, heavy weapons, and just go in guns blazing. Yeah, or you can just assign uh, supporting agents around the level with sniper rifles and have like a single agent go inside and just mark the targets. So 
there are a lot of options there. I think a really important uh, aspect of games like yours, I'm not saying there's many games like yours, is that the variety of mission styles. Uh, what have you guys looked at, maybe from past for inspiration, or maybe some games that you thought, hey, it would be better if you did this? Uh, when it came to giving people variety, I know you're talking about from a gameplay standpoint, being able to do stealth or run and gun, but also like from a mission standpoint, uh, what kind of variety do you guys plan to give players? Okay, so the way it works is every mission, like the, the, the way we create missions for the player is it's a layered system. So one thing is as you go on a mission, we select, we randomly select uh, a level, a layout that you haven't seen yet. And there is enough to give you two playthroughs without having seen, without seeing anything twice. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, every mission can happen all in any place around the world. So um, we populate the levels with uh, local law enforcement. So, for example, if you were to go on a mission in China, you'd have Chinese policemen speaking Chinese and civilians and so on. And the next level is depending on the circumstances in the world map, depending on what the enemy agents are trying to do, we will give you different objectives. And the agents you will face, like the enemy agents, will also depend on what, you, what you've done previously in the world map. So it could, that's oh. where the like sleeper agents come in for a second. Uh, and if, if the context provides such data, uh, you might have one of your operatives kidnapped and being held at the place. So they, there's a lot of going on in terms yeah. of putting it all together. Very cool. You know, and it's it's kind of interesting uh, because this is like uh, there's definitely some undertones about espionage and other things. Uh, America right now is going through something with Russia <laughs> right. and yeah. with China, actually. Yeah. Uh, two former communist kind of communist nations. Uh, are you guys looking at what's happening in real life? Or are you yeah. creating a fancy world? Like, where? Do, what time does this take place in? It's actually right. pretty funny because when we started working on it and decided to do Cold War, we weren't exactly sure if people still get it. Because, you know, it was a while ago. Like, not everyone remembers, like, GoldenEye and, you know, all those movies. And it suddenly is so up to date. <laughs> right? <laughs> Got it. Is there a mission where you have to infiltrate Facebook headquarters? <laughs> well, uh, maybe let's, let's... That is an amazing idea, man. Yep. Free ideas. Although, free ideas. Free ideas, ideas again. Is, it would have been like 1980s Facebook, right. which is just the Ministry of Propaganda or something. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah, we have that, definitely. We have that. Yeah. So, oh, awesome. So the closest you can get. Yeah. But, you know, so let's take a step back. It's the 1980s Cold War, which... Okay. Yeah, some people think this is like the end of the Cold War. The Russians were already friends with uh, NATO and every, everything like that. But that's very far from the truth. That was the second most volatile period after the Cuban crisis, in my opinion. Absolutely. Because as the Soviet Union was falling apart, nobody knew what was going to happen where yeah. the nukes would end up and uh, you know how much chaos there would be in, in there would be in Europe in countries like you know Poland where yeah. we're from yeah where you guys and, grew up yeah exactly so uh, that's a very interesting time and uh, the part partially our choice was influenced by the need to find the time uh, that was familiar to people to audiences because it's not ancient you've got like, you've got mobile phones but big you've got GPS big, but yeah clumsy and like inaccurate right. but you can just refer to certain technologies and certainly spies would have access to that right yeah, because sure. all yeah, of yeah. that are the, the, the military tech <laughs> or the military inventions from the Cold War arms race absolutely uh, but still you needed to be in most places in person you needed to infiltrate facilities to get your actual hands onto evidence information files uh, because otherwise, if we did a modern uh, espionage game, we would just do, you know, hacking from across the ocean. Yeah. Which is interesting, but it's not a it's not as good exciting tactical yeah. game. It's not material. as fun. Yeah. Very cool. True that. Yeah. And 
another part of uh, Phantom Doctrine, gathering information is very important in this game. Oh, yes. Uh, you guys kind of have an espionage or an investigative mode where you have like a board that you interact with. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? So, um, I'll start with the whole gathering information thing. Because okay. It's like early in the production, we decided that the game should be about secrets. It's like secret is like the sauce we add to every single thing in the game. Right. So agents have secret perks and you need to reveal, you need secret information to do, to, to use on the board. Like the places where you, the, where the missions take place are secret and you can reveal that as well. Enemy identity agents, uh, uh, enemy agents identities are secret as well. So as you go through the game, you collect intel. It was like sort of documents. Because the thing is, enemy agents generate a paper trail of sorts. They create, right. they use documents. Yeah. Uh, however, the, the thing is, they don't exactly use real names in these or street addresses. Obviously, they use code names mm. or aliases. So, um, as you collect these, you cross-reference the code names that appear across different papers and connect them with a string on a board to get to the bottom of things. Got it. Yeah, uh, I actually got to play it at Pack South myself, mm -hmm. and that was one of my favorite things. Like trying to, you, you find all these different things. Even in like uh, in uh, interrogating people, you get a little bit more information, yeah. and you have the board, and you're putting the little strings and everything. Because people have seen that in like movies and stuff. Yeah. You're actually draw, getting the keywords to match up and everything. That's very, very awesome, there's but it a, actually plays a part in it. There's that, have you seen It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, yep. a TV show? Oh, yeah, there's always you know that, 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 pe <laughs> that, pe that Pepe Sylvia yeah. scene where he's like, I got boxes full of Pepe. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like there's, there's going to be a Pepe Sylvia moment at some point in this game that I'm looking forward so to. Eureka. Uh, Finally got it. Yeah, but rebuilding this paranoid experience that you see in the movies was like the, the biggest challenge there. Yeah. <laughs> got it, got it, got it. So it's worth saying that the content of the board is generated. Oh, yeah. So the code names change, they differ. So you don't learn that, you know, this guy is X and that's it. Yeah. The next time you play, it's different. And uh, we've used it, we like this investigation board mechanic so much that we use it also for something you can call almost like side quests, side cases, okay. where you get very uh, uh, tangible rewards, like access to weapons and technologies and contacts that you can immediately use. It's not always the main bad guy that you keep working on. You just find information and quickly put it to use, just locate something and, and, and make a good use of that resource. Yeah. So what, pl what platforms will your game release on? It's PC and consoles, uh, and it's this year. We're just finishing the game right now. Uh, that's a lot of work. That's not easier at all from yeah. just developing course, it course. all oh, yeah. the way. When you say consoles, do you mean? Uh, the big ones for now, but uh, Switch, nothing nothing solid. I know we were going to ask about yeah. that. Because <laughs> UE4, you know, yeah. it runs on Switch. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're looking at different platforms, but right now it's PC, the Xbox, and PlayStation. Cool. OK, cool. Um, you know, where can we find out more about the game? Well, you need to follow uh, Good Shepherd, obviously, our great publisher, and also uh, our uh, Facebook page, uh, Creative Forge Games, that's us, and at CFG Main on Twitter. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate you guys making the time coming down oh, here. Thank you for having us. I hope us. you guys have had a great show. I know it's day four. We're all very tired. <laughs> well, it's always a pleasure to just be able to get the game in front of you know hundreds of people every day yeah. and see how differently they respond. And uh, to Casper and the guys on, from his team in here, so designers, it's the most, actually the most valuable yeah, uh, lesson, the is. most valuable ty type of playtasting. And the humbling because, one. Yeah, and, the, because, and, your booth, and the hardest, yeah. Your booth itself has been this great psychological experiment where it's like danger, do not touch, tre <laughs> no trespassing, you have barbed wire, and yet people still are touching it. Well, all day long. nature, people. right? I am one of those people. Yeah, I showed them a picture of you earlier. <laughs> I was but, disappointed uh, it wasn't real, but I know that there are uh, circumstances uh, that don't allow for that. I will not name any names, but there is a person uh, 
uh, who had this idea that we might just buy a cattle prod and randomly sneak up to people, <laughs> and when they touch it, we actually just... So it's know. real for somebody. Yep. <laughs> That's an oh interesting idea. We yeah. might do that at one point. I, I uh, back it. Get some liability insurance before you do that. <laughs> oh yeah, right. That's the that's America. Okay. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, maybe save that for Gamescom. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, any other uh, any other tips for uh, sneaking into this? Uh, are you guys gonna do a beta or any kind of demo before it releases? Well, this is a this is a really big game in terms of content and that you know how complete we think it is. We're making everything to make it worth the price, and uh, that means we're just working towards a full release. So That's the, it. the best way is to come to events like PAX to get your hands on. Check oh, it yeah. out. That's right. That's why we're here. Awesome. Right. Understood. Thank you guys for coming back and coming over here. Thanks to Good Shepherd for setting this up. <clears throat> we're going to be right back with another Good Shepherd game, actually, uh, Semblance. They're so, all good ones. Yeah, right? Yeah. So stay tuned. We're going to be right back. And uh, we got a whole lot more games coming. See you in a bit.